Welcome to International Women Leaders. Our mission is to inspire, educate, unite women and men from all over the world through media. My name is Jemmy, and today I had the honor of interviewing Eileen Rizzo. She has three masters and getting her PhD in the areas of math and education. And she's also running for state assembly. We interviewed her in a public library, so there's a lot of background noise. But hopefully you enjoy our interview with Ms. Eileen Rizzo. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, what's your story? What's my story? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, the firstborn of five children, yeah. um, my parents are um, Hispanic Americans, but um, mm -hmm. I have some Native American in my mom's side, yeah. and um, we, my parents were hardworking. My dad worked at the post office. Uh, really, my family was really dedicated to being hard workers and providing for us. My father always encouraged us to go to college, and so I became the first in my family to go to college. I studied. Um, secondary mathematics education. Okay. Yeah, I really fell in love with math like at an early age, although I didn't realize that um, it was something, you know, you could have a career in or you could be. Mm -hmm. Until um, I was in middle school, I had a math teacher who really took an interest in me. And I was like the quietest girl in the class. Like I would never raise my hand, mm -hmm. never anything like that. But she started like asking me questions and mm -hmm. um, asking me how I solve problems. And then my um, peers like sitting next to me were like, oh, I'm gonna ask Aileen to help me do my math work, you know, when I, have a, when I can't solve problem or anything. Mm -hmm. So as they started asking me for help, my confidence uh, started building, you know. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, well, I really like helping people with something that is hard for them to do. I really like helping explain it. And, mm -hmm. and so I really liked the feeling of just serving people. So I decided, Pretty, pretty early on that I wanted to be a math teacher when I grew up. And so um, I was a teacher in the classroom for 13 years in, in high school and in middle school. And I got to work with, um, my favorite part of that was working with um, immigrant children. Um, I was a lead teacher on a, a team of teachers that we had 150 kids that didn't have English as their first language. They were new to the country. And we, um, we each taught our own subject, but we always nurtured them in the vocabulary and their English language and everything like that. Try to get them um, up to par culturally, you know, try to be sensitive into where they were coming from. We had kids from Vietnam, from a lot from Mexico and South America. Um, at that time, I had um, earned a master's in educational technology, and I had worked um, with a software company uh, designing like math software for kids to learn math online or mm -hmm. through computer programming. It was very new, it was like in the year 2000, so that kind of idea was kind of being still navigated through. <clears throat> I worked for three years in that area, but I really missed the classroom. So when I went back to the classroom, mm -hmm. I, I of course used technology in my classroom. I yeah. bought my own, with my own money, I oh, bought four computers for my classroom. Um, for I school, did. Right? It was a public school, it was an inner city public school in yeah. Phoenix, and um, everyone would come in and be like, wow, who, who gave you money for these computers, right? And they'd be like, oh, I bought them with my own money. And yeah. You know, teachers do that all the time. Oh, I mean, that's just oh, reality. Sure, yeah. Teachers always spend a lot of money for their classrooms, and I was just like them. I mean, I spent hundreds of dollars mm -hmm. trying to give my kids the best that they had, mm -hmm. that they could get. And so um, it was in that time where um, that's when I got the job to... Um, come to the county office, uh, Fresno County Office of Education, oh, okay. and I got a job there as a mathematics consultant, mm -hmm. which meant that um, I was on the math department as a person who would work with teachers. There's like over 30 districts in Fresno County, uh -huh. school districts, and we would work with those teachers and helping them with um, teaching math, uh, learning math standards. Um, teaching them classes. I got to teach um, classes on engineering and coding mm -hmm. to teachers when that started becoming popular. Mm -hmm. um, and then I earned actually a master's at Fresno Pacific mm -hmm. in uh, math education. So I earned a second master's in that yeah. capacity. Two, two masters. So that, right? that brought me to two masters, yeah. Oh. And so um, in 2012, I was in my fourth year at the county office and um, Fresno, right? Fresno County Office of Education. And um, 
we had just finished having a business lunch where we were talking about a grant that we were working on. Mm -hmm. And everyone had left, and the, the lunch was pretty much over. But um, me and my colleagues were still there. Yeah. It was, um, I think, four of us or five of us. Mm -hmm. And um, I was only the wo only woman on the math department. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they were looking to hire some more people. And so one of the newly hires was a male. And he was talking to the other males. And he said, you know, I, I got step nine on my, on my contract. I just signed my contract. What is step nine? Step nine. So step nine meant like there was um, 10 steps on a salary schedule. Uh -huh. And um, there was one to 10. And so 10 was the highest um, salary you could get. And one was the lowest you could get within the position of being a math consultant. Oh, okay. So when I came in, I was given step one, oh, step one. and I thought, I ignorantly thought that yeah. that's where everyone started, mm -hmm. and that everyone started at one, and then you climbed oh. forward every year. Mm -hmm. But when he told the other males that he had gotten step nine, yeah. I was really like puzzled and how he could get nine, right? Yeah. So um, nine meant, uh, $13,000 more oh, every wow. year. Of, wow. So that was a significant mm -hmm. difference in pay. But what also was troubling me was the fact that because I had worked with him previously, mm -hmm. I knew that he didn't have a master's degree oh. and I knew it, I had more experience and that I had been a teacher. I had started teaching mm -hmm. um, before he did. So the experience and the seniority and the education all puzzled me as how he could get nine. Yeah. I ended up making an appointment with the HR administrator oh. and I had convinced myself yeah. that what they had paid me was a mistake. Mm -hmm. But I had also done some research in the ideas of what equal pay was mm -hmm. and that we had a law, the Equal Pay Law, the Equal Pay Act. And I remember reading in the Equal Pay Act that it said to alleviate a, discrim a discriminatory pay you couldn't um, bring the man's pay lower. Uh -huh. That was illegal. So if I would complain, mm -hmm. I knew that the male who had gotten higher pay couldn't be made lower mm -hmm. to make it equal, right? Uh -huh. So when I went to HR, I was like, okay, so I'm not gonna hurt anyone. Yeah. I'm just advocating for myself. Mm -hmm. And I went there and I asked about you know, what, what I had discovered mm -hmm. and um, she told me that what had happened is that they used my previous salary to base my salary. Oh. So that it didn't matter education experience or seniority. Mm -hmm. It only mattered what I was making before I got there. Uh -huh. And she said that when, you know, you have an application packet that you submit when you want a job, yeah. and it tells you everything that you have to have in your packet. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I had to have in my packet was the contract from the school I came from. And the contract from the school I came from had my salary on it. Yeah. And that was used to base my salary. So when I asked about that, I asked, well, how can that be um, something that you always use? Because you know it depends on wherever you're coming from, yeah. how you would get paid. How does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, you were getting paid so low. Oh. Um, even if we gave you a 5% raise on what you were making, you still were below step one. And so it was significant that I had been paid a lot less. Um, I, because I had already educated myself about the Equal Pay Act, I asked her, you know, well, how can you justify this if there's a law that says you can't pay a man and a woman a different, a different pay? Mm -hmm. And so she says, well, this is the way we've always done it. And that's a dangerous phrase in the English yeah. language because it really tells us that um, things that are not necessarily done right can keep happening. Yeah. So um, I, t I told her, you know, I, don't, I think this is a violation of this law. And so she said she would investigate it. Mm -hmm. That investigation took yeah. weeks before I even get a response. But... I remember thinking as I came home and knowing that they were not going to fix that for me, um, what I was going to do about it. Yeah. And so at the time, my first thought was to get a new job and yeah. to just leave the county office yeah. um, because I didn't want to continue being paid less for no reason. Mm. I felt that that was a great injustice 
Um, but I also thought about as I came home, I have, I have two daughters at the time, yeah. and they both ran to me and said, oh, mom's home that day that I came home. And I remember thinking, what will life be like for them if I don't do anything about this? Yeah. So my girls really inspired me to do something about it, to not walk away and let this happen to someone else. Because I knew that if I walked away, mm -hmm. it would just happen to someone else. There was someone else who was going to come and discover she was being paid less and discover why and think about how it made her feel. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really hard because um, at the time, I was the only breadwinner of our family, so I was the only one who had a job. My husband was staying home with the girls. They were young. And we had just bought a house. We, we had finally moved out of the apartment and got a house. And so when I made the decision to go forward with a lawsuit, it was a, it was a very difficult thing for my husband and I to decide to do together. Yeah. But we, we both felt very passionate that um, injustice can't go unopposed. Mm -hmm. You know, if we do that, then it's almost like we allow it to keep perpetuating. Mm -hmm. um, what I didn't know at that time in 2012 that it would take this long, oh, long to finally. So it's been um, six years uh -huh. since that first day, and uh, it it was you know all the different parts of the legal system that you have to go through. Um, Proving that your case is worthy to go forward was the first step. Um, getting threats that they were going to counter sue you mm -hmm. because you brought a lawsuit. Um, and then finally, this past uh, April, April 9th, April 9th, the Ninth Circuit unanimously said that you cannot justify a pay differential um, with someone's previous salary, okay. meaning that. You, you couldn't pay a man and a woman less and then said, oh, we're, going, we're paying her less because she was making less. Mm -hmm. that, that violated the very reason why the Equal Pay Act was written. Mm -hmm. um, that, that experience really changed me. Um, it made me aware of the things that have to be changed mm -hmm. and that um, how hard it is to change things. Mm -hmm. And so 2014, I began um, testifying in Sacramento at the Capitol, testifying um, for pay equity bills because uh, the Equal Pay Act is like over 50 years old yeah. and there's a lot of ways that employers have used to pay women less. Mm -hmm. And so one of those um, loopholes was the use of prior salary, mm -hmm. um, specifically how it hurts women. Mm -hmm. And so one of those pay equity bills was California Fair Pay Act. Mm -hmm. uh, the California Fair Pay Act said um, an employer can't stop you from talking about your pay. Mm -hmm. A lot of times employers tell you to sign something that you're not going to talk about how much you're, gonna, you're making, mm -hmm. but when they do that, women are especially impacted because I think about that day that I found out had, had that you know, coworker not said anything, mm -hmm. I would have never known, right? Um, I also think about the idea that um, a lot of women go underpaid because we don't talk about it with each other or with other males that we work with. So it would prohibit that. And so um, when I went to testify for these bills, which were that bill, and then there was um, a pay salary history bill, a salary history bill would say you couldn't ask anyone their previous salary, not just women, but anyone. And that by doing that, we will now pay people based on all of their experience and what they bring and then based on the job mm. and not look at how much they were getting paid yeah. because then you exploit someone to do work for less money mm. that really were exploiting I think women and people of color mm. and so um, when I was doing that we would go on um, advocacy days and an advocacy day was a day where you would not only testify maybe in front of a committee, but you would go and visit legislatures and we would ask them to vote yes on these bills and you would tell them why. Um, because legislatures, they, they need to see the real people, they need to hear the real stories and hear how things are impacting people now and how they can change for the better. And um, in one of those times, I passed by my representative's office 
and um, I recognized the name and everything. And but when I walked by the leader on that advocacy day, she said, um, "Let's not bother going in that office." And when she said, "Let's not bother," I kind of thought, "Well, why? Like, why would you say that?" And I said, but he's my representative. And I felt like I should have been going in there because he is my representative. I felt like if anybody would support me, he would because he represents me. He can vote on my behalf. But she said, well, we never, we never get good support when we walk in there. And so I was really surprised by that. And so when we um, stopped there, she said, you can go in if you want. And I said, okay, I will. So I walked in there. And I, um, he was in there. He was present. He saw me. I told him my story. I told him, you know, I'm, I'm testifying for these two bills, and I appreciate your vote yes. And he said, well, you know, there's going to be frivolous lawsuits if we, if we pass these laws. And I told him, you know, my, my case has been in the courts for almost three years now. And I told him, a lot of women don't have the opportunity to you know, sue their employer or to do the things that I'm doing. I said, for those women, we need to make the law stronger. At the end of that advocacy day, the, all the members sit on the floor and you can go to the balcony and you can watch them vote oh, okay. on the bills that are set to vote that day. And I remember him voting no. And I was really disappointed. Like, that was like, a moment I, I'll never forget because I was so disappointed in what was happening that I couldn't believe it. Almost like I felt kind of betrayed. So you, know. you saw him, right? Yeah, because I had just seen him and talked to him. And so after that, um, I was just made aware of his voting record and how he was voting. And that kind of um, made me more civically engaged myself into what was happening. So is that why you ran? Yeah, that's, that's really why I ran. When I yeah. realized how he was voting, um, I was just really disturbed. Mm -hmm. And I realized that since 2012, they were, um, he, he won his seat in 2012. And in 2014, no one ran against him. And then in 2016, um, someone ran against him and he won. And then in 2018, no one was going to run against him again. Oh. And so um, I remember telling a group of people, you know, someone needs to run, like yeah. people need a choice. And uh, someone looked at me and said, well, what about you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I remember thinking that that was like, this is not a good time for, uh -huh. for this to happen in my life. I have three daughters. The youngest is three years old. Uh -huh. um, I had just been accepted into a PhD program. Oh, wow. okay. and. Um, I was excited to start that and I was like, well, and I remember looking at my husband and thinking, you know, is this a good idea? Yeah. And he said, yeah, do it, do it. And so um, I decided to run because I wanted to give the people back their voice, mm -hmm. let them know that um, I care about making sure that everyone is represented, yeah. that everyone's voice is heard and that the issues that matter to us the most are the issues that the person who represents us is fighting for. If we don't have a choice on, on voting in November 6th, then you know, the same people hold those offices. So how has campaigning been? Where did you begin? Did you know you said you had prior experience? I didn't have any experience at all, so I have just had to seek advice from people who kind of have navigated this before me or have helped other campaigns. Surround myself with people who knew about those rules and be willing to get advice from them. And they would tell me, oh, don't make sure you do this. And then I'd have to say, oh, I didn't know I had to do that, you know. I think all of that has been difficult. And also um, how much money things take. So there's a lot of fees that you have to pay for. Um, when you decide to run for office, there's mm -hmm. upfront fees and fees for things like, you know, the voter guide. And you, you, you want a paragraph in there that costs $6,500. I mean, a lot of those things are very expensive. And that's unfortunate because it makes running for office exclusive to people who are rich. And I really feel like um, we shouldn't just have wealthy people in in those positions, we need to have people that are like us, 
that represent us, that understand where we're coming from. Um, and that is not necessarily the richest person, you know, at the table. I think about educators, and educators aren't necessarily the richest people. I mean, yeah. they, they're not in very lucrative fields, but um, they're great people at solving problems, working together, knowing how to communicate. Um, and those are um, characteristics that we want of people in government. Yeah, like what's one lesson that you learned and you like to share? Okay. Okay, growing up and being a very quiet person. Sometimes you get into a, a zone where you think that you can't make a difference. Like you're not that exuberant, loud person who everyone listens to or captures everyone's attention. Sometimes it's not about being the loudest, but sometimes it's about being um, persevering. So I think my fight for equal pay has shown me that everyone's voice can make a difference. All you have to be willing to do is to use it. That takes, that takes a lot of courage um, sometimes to be able to use your voice, but if you're willing to use your voice and to um, stand, the, stand the ground that you need to stand, persevere, um, you can make a change that can change the lives of maybe yourself, but maybe other people's too, because that kind of courage inspires people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think that I would encourage anyone who thinks, you know, well, I can't make a difference or what I do doesn't matter. It does, and your voice does matter. Um, and we need your voice because I think, you know, the picture of our society and our community is beautiful when everybody's part of that picture. Mm -hmm. when, when society starts cutting out and, you know, ripping out pieces, mm -hmm. that the picture isn't as beautiful anymore. And so we need everyone's voice. We need you to be heard. We want to hear what you're saying and what's important to you. And so I think that's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned. Oh, okay. Well, is there any, anything you'd like to add before we end? It looks like my case will go to the Supreme Court. Oh, it's um, not finished yet. So it's not finished. Oh, so okay. the Ninth Circuit decided uh, unanimously in my favor, mm. but the, um, my employer has decided that they want to take it to the Supreme oh, Court. Okay. So yeah. my hope is that um, we will see my case not overturned yeah. because if it is overturned, I think the pay equity of women across the nation is now threatened. Oh, wow. um, if you can pay a woman less because she was making less, yeah. right, why do you have an Equal Pay Act? It doesn't even make sense. Mm -hmm. If the Supreme Court um, decides to take the case, then they have the power to either overturn the decision or to confirm it and then the case can go to trial. And so. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be um, a really big case nationally, and a lot of people will be looking at that. Um, and as far as my own journey in politics, I mean, I'm excited to see what November has. I think, um, I think uh, it's it's a time of change, mm -hmm. and I really believe that in November um, I'll win the seat and I will be able to represent the people uh, whose voices have not been heard, and to start giving people back their representation and not the corporate corporations, not the special interests. Um, it's time for that change to happen here in, in this district. So I'm excited. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for taking the time thank to interview with us. Yeah, thank you yeah. for having me.